So I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves in a second. Um, I think our goal tonight is to make this useful to you, and so I think that starts with us understanding who's here and making sure we leave a lot of time for your questions. So let me just ask, show of hands, how many of you are interested in now or in the past in working at a technology company? Okay, keep your hands up if you're interested in now or in the past in starting a technology company. Okay, have worked at a technology company or currently work at one, keep your hand up. Wow, okay, have started a technology company. Okay, awesome. Ton of founders in the room. A lot of then peer learning. Um, we'll get at that. Um, you know, I'll share a little bit about my journey, but the short version is when I graduated from college, I had no idea that I was going to be involved in the startup world. Um, I graduated in 98. Scarily, I had my first experience this past week where a founder pitched me and said, hey, my dad was social studies in the 90s. You might know my dad. And I was like, man. So did a little math, his dad was early 90s, I'm late 90s, so I have like seven or eight more years before that might actually happen for real. So I've started to prepare myself. And um, I graduated in the first dot-com boom. In the first dot-com boom, the types of people who were working on technology companies were nowhere near as awesome and varied as the kinds of folks that we have in this room. It was just a totally different ecosystem, and it's been such a delight to see it change and to see Harvard and New York become part of it. We'll talk some history in a second, but why don't we start, Sarah, with you, just quick introduction of who you are, your entrepreneurial experience, what your company is, but then also the Harvard lens of like anything you were particularly involved in, year, house, whatever is important to you to share. Uh, sure. I will start by saying that I am a first-time entrepreneur. I never thought I would start a startup. Maybe start with your startup. full name. So we oh, know who sorry. You are. Sarah LaFleur. I'm Thank the you. founder and CEO of MM LaFleur. Uh, we are a DTC, direct-to-consumer, uh, lifestyle company for working women. So we sell primarily clothing, shoes, accessories, really targeted for uh, busy working women, uh, doing mostly machine washable, wrinkle resistant, uh, highly functional clothing that doesn't look like athleisure. That's kind of my, my quick summary of our, awesome. our brand. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I never thought, I graduated in 06, so times were good. Um, I thought I was gonna work in a, a refugee camp, which is what I had done the summer before, and then uh, a bunch of my uh, friends came back with signing bonuses uh, senior fall, and $5,000 in the bank, and I never knew you could make so much money by signing a piece of paper, and so I ended up going down the consulting route, ended up at Bain, um, and then back in South Africa, uh, thinking I would try the nonprofit thing again, didn't work, came back and did private equity, uh, and then left that to start MM, and so um, it's a fashion company, and it's a tech company, but I had experience in neither. Um, I really started it because I, as a working woman, struggled to find good, good workwear, um, so very much based on my own personal experience, and I can consider myself the customer. Um, and I was Winthrop, I was social studies, totally unrelated. What do you mean totally unrelated? Oh, to anything I do today. Oh, come but on. I have fond Everybody needs a little Habermas in their life when they start a company. <laughs> come on. Um, all right, but let's keep going. Well, you already answered, by the way, my first question, which is how did you first know when you wanted to start a company? So let's, I would love to hear that as part of the introductions we've got. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Brennan Putnam, uh, founder and CEO of Mir. Uh, we're a technology company that builds a mirror that streams live and on-demand workouts to you in your home. Um, I'm Harvard 05, also Winthrop House, mm -hmm. uh, Russian literature and culture, um, also completely irrelevant to anything that I do today, <laughs> and um, have always really been in the health and wellness space. So I uh, was a professional dancer at the New York City Ballet, uh, childhood, kept dancing in college, got involved with uh, boutique fitness studios when I graduated. She's and being very modest. She's an incredible dancer. I mean, she okay. danced with the New York City Ballet. And we I heard it, but it went her. by so fast. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> it was and like then a, Mozart, you right. know. I saw her perform, I think it was my junior year on stage, and I thought she was just the most beautiful dancer ever. So. Right. Yay. The head, head of comms that. at Mir, Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, Mir grew out of uh, a decade of, of operating, owning and operating a chain of fitness studios here in New York called Refined Method, um, and we just launched this past fall. Wait, 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 hold on. So this is your second business now, correct? Yes, first business, bootstrap, brick and mortar, second business. Uh, what made you decide you wanted to start the first business? What's the first moment you can remember saying, I'm going to start a company now? Um, he'll probably sell me out, so I'll sell myself out. Um, I think I'm not a, I'm not a great employee. I'm, I'm more of sort of an independent operator. Being a dancer is very much a solo profession. So I think it, it didn't really occur to me that I would go sort of work in an office or 
go work in a large company, I always knew that I wanted to create something. Um, and I think I saw a really great market opportunity uh, having taught Alex. in the boutique space. So sort of the, I don't want to say destined from the beginning, but the contemplating doing something on your own for a long time versus the not contemplating doing it on your own. I mean, my college roommate was talking about entrepreneurship all four years. I had no idea what he was talking about. Then he did his investment banking job. And then he's like, I'm going to start this company that our other roommate had financed on his credit card to do college t-shirts. And I was like, what are you doing with your life? Custom Inc., if you've bought their t-shirts, it's like a multi-hundred million dollar revenue company now. But, you know, it's just so, so stunning to see many ways up the mountain. So, Lowell? Uh, Lowell Putnam, class of 05. I was on Lowell House, uh, American history and literature major. Uh, not a whole lot relevant to what I do today. No, um, you're all saying that, but I have to say, the humanitarian, humanities people yeah. will strongly beg to differ. I'm going to challenge that in a moment. That's true. I, I, read, I read every day. I read exactly. like six days a week, I read words. Yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, I was, I guess, a, a year ahead of, of you, and so I didn't see anyone coming with investment banking bonuses, but no, five, they were just handing out investment banking jobs to anyone who looked roughly like me. And so I got a job at Lehman Brothers, which seemed awesome because I didn't know how to do anything. Um, then it wasn't so awesome, uh, and I worked at Barclays, and then I got laid off from Barclays. It um, wasn't so awesome because after all of these many years of education through which you've worked so hard and prepared, and you go for the safety of an established institution, not wild and crazy startup, but the safety of an established institution, the institution collapsed. It collapsed, it collapsed, okay. absolutely. And Checking so, that that's what you And meant. so then I worked at Barclays, and then I, I got laid off. And so I started um, Quovo, which was um, the company that I just recently sold to uh, Plaid, which is a competitor in the space, thanks. Um, uh, because I didn't really know what else to do, and I didn't get into HBS. Um, so I, I have a lot to thank for not getting Lehman into Lehman turned me down. Best thing that ever happened to me. Right? So, you know, that's, that's what happens. So um, the idea of, of Quovo and Plaid is the idea of aggregating your bank account and investment account data. So if you've used a bunch of the... Actually, those logos are customers of, of our companies, like Betterment, um, Venmo's not on there, but um, all these fintech guys, Stripe's on there, um, they all use us to link your, your account. So any place you put in your bank account credentials online and then you've gotten something out of that, you've been using probably one of our two companies or now one company, Plaid. Um, so uh, Plaid was a smaller, it was a larger of the two of us. Um, and last fall, we had the opportunity at Quovo to either raise our Series C or um, get acquired. Um, and Plaid had access to uh, a lot of capital and was doing really well. And so all the pieces came together. So um, I'm a very good employee. Um, and I am one again now at Plaid. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, you've all made this reference in passing to the thing that I did was unrelated to the thing that you're doing now, meaning you studied something as an undergrad that was unrelated. And before we challenge that, delve into it for a second, one way in which it seems to me the entrepreneurial founding journey is really different from being a student at a prestigious school is you study, you're given questions, you know, tests with 100 questions, you answer 98 of them correctly, you move on to the next stage. Things generally proceed, not in a straight line, but like you kind of know what's expected of you and you um, succeed at it and proceed forward. Founders often have an oh shit moment relatively early in the journey. We're like, what have I done here? Um, you know, Mike Bloomberg talks about the fact that two years into starting Bloomberg LP, all of his friends started coming to him and saying, isn't it time for a regular job? And so I'm curious, as you chose this occupation, what an early moment is you can remember where you just thought, maybe this was a huge catastrophic mistake. And if you never had that, God bless, but don't answer this question. I mean, I think I had that thought every single day. Daily. First year, yeah. at least. Um, I always had my resume in my back pocket, and I, I was this close to submitting it on so many occasions. Uh, I basically, I quit my job, I gave it two weeks notice, um, and I didn't stay very long at this private equity firm. Uh, and so I felt at that point that I had ruined my resume. And that actually was the moment where I actually I applied to Google, um, and they asked me what my SAT score was, and I was 27 at that point, and then, so I was like, I can't still be like telling people what my SAT score is. Wait, wait Google asked you as a 27-year-old what your SAT score was? Yes. Oh, I hope they don't still do that. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I think it was one of those moments where I was like, I, I don't want to do that. Oh, I've I've had this idea in the back of my mind for a long time, maybe I should just go try it because, you know, I'm not married, I don't have a mortgage, I don't have kids, like I have no responsibilities, so why not? Um, but I, I really started my company during a, a point of very low confidence in my 
not just in my professional life, I would say my entire life, like 27 was a real yeah. personal crisis for me. Um, so I started working on this idea, but you know, there was a lot of head padding, like, oh, Sarah's working on her dress company, like that kind of thing. Um, and I really had nothing to show for it. So uh, it, was, it was really painful. I started tutoring um, every day, and that's how I made ends meet. Um, I told my now husband, then partner, that we needed to become domestic partners so I could get on his health insurance plan because Obamacare wasn't, wasn't a thing back then. I mean, it was like very trying times. Um, so I, I would say that feeling went on for a very, very long time. And it probably wasn't until we actually sold our first product that I was like, oh, finally, I have like a physical, tangible something to show for it. Uh, but I think that that fear was constant. Yeah, that I like talking just about that identity question around, you know, you say you're doing something and your friends giving you that patronizing yes. thing is, yeah. I feel like that's such a core sort of am I a founder experience. Two oh. years is about that that period. I Two years of just constant soul crushing grief. Yeah. And then, and then I guess the, the real <laughs> shit moment was after a year and a half of just soul crushing grief, I applied to HPS again and then also got rejected. Oh. So, but then we had, so, then we had people agree to give us money. We got our seed round funded. And so it, it was that it was the second rejection that kind of started turning things around for me. So the, it was one rejection, two years of pain, and then a second rejection. So, and then finally things turned around. Let me ask on that. And Bryn, I want to get, get your answer in a second too, but how did you, this, like, there are occupational skills, I think, of coping with those thoughts and feelings that you have. How did you cope? Oh, I'm, I'm an incredible procrastinator. And so, the, <laughs> the, and so you know, you, you can vouch for this, that I just, I don't pay bills. I can, I can just have a bill for $40 from Con Ed, sit there, and I can not pay it for weeks for no reason at all. And I just sold my company for a shitload of money, and I just don't pay $40 for for no real reason. And so I was able to procrastinate rational thought and like pro it. progress denial in my life. Was it your coping it, mechanism? Complete denial for, for 12 months. If it works. <laughs> is this true? Any corrections, Bren? This is the first time we've been on a panel, so I'm just... Is that right? <laughs> the first time you guys have been on a panel together? I, I, think, really it's, I think it's going great. To, I think it's we're going to get to asking about how you do marriage as, uh, as both founders in a minute, but... Just, I'm so excited to see where he takes us. There we um, go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the ship moment, um, so I had operated um, Refine Method for seven, about seven years when I decided to start Mir, and it was, um, you know, a profitable business, kicking off money and uh, very stable, you know, really could sort of run itself to some degree, and made the decision to start Mir uh, when I was uh, about six months pregnant. So uh, signed the deal docs for my seed round uh, from the hospital the day that our son was born, and then showed up two weeks later at my first actual office, um, like a cube and a WeWork. And so I think the, sort of the oh, oh shit moment was like sitting on the floor of the WeWork pumping and realizing that I had voluntarily chosen to start an even larger, more complicated business um, after achieving some amount of stability and success with the first business um, and thinking that maybe it was a bad idea. Can I ask about that? Uh, so I started the company that I co-founded. Both of us, me and my co-founder, were both parents. And I think for her and for me, we both had babies born within two months or so of starting the company. And I think back on that time, and I don't know if I made the right decisions. How do you, when you look back now, like seeing something that is seems to be working, and you know, that is you have a little distance. How do you feel about the choices you made then in terms of parenting choices um, versus company choices, or was it not like that? Oh yeah, for sure. I, he'll, he'll give you a much funnier answer, but. Um... You know, I think... Okay, we want the honest. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think I, I grew up with a stay-at-home mom who I think when we became teenagers and suddenly didn't need quite as much love and support, I uh, felt a little bit lost um, personally. So I think for me, it's always been really important to have uh, my own identity, my own life, and my own career, and it brings me a lot of fulfillment. So um, I sort of believe that fundamentally that will be something that will be important, important to our to, to look for. But in the moment of sort of the trade-offs between being there for all the important moments for the first two or three years of his life and running my business, um, the business is definitely, definitely taking priority. Yeah, I, I think categorically, I, at least speaking for myself, I'm not, I was not a, the kind of father or your husband or friend that I wanted to be when I was CEO of Quovo. I, I, it simply was a higher priority for me than the other things in my life. And I don't know if that has to be the case, but at least in hindsight, I feel like it needed to be the case for me to get to the outcome I got yeah. to. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we, you just asked us this, Sarah, and I was sort of joking, but not, not really, that 
we were both going through a lot last fall with her launching the product and me selling the business. And we said, well, George is fine. He didn't he didn't drink any poison, and then we remembered, actually, he did drink poison last <laughs> fall. He drank some Jet Dry, and it was totally fine. But d d just, just to give a sense of what wow. happened, we, it, it, that, that is what last fall was like for us as parents. Yeah. Sarah, any thoughts on this? Oh, kids? Well, or, I mean, the general, yes, and the general just question of those hard choices. I mean, I'll just share, for me, I often felt like, oh, I'm intentionally deciding to be less good as a founder so that I can be there as a dad less good at being there as a friend and a husband, I think, but definitely felt like I was prioritizing being a dad. And from my kids' perspective, they were like, what do you mean? You were like distracted and absent all the time. And they're now old enough to be able to lecture me on that. And my son drew a picture of a, of a, like a bar graph with a telephone underneath, and it said, how much time, calls me Abba, which is dad in Hebrew, spends on the phone, and it was colored in up to a nine out of 10 and said, please stop at the bottom. And I was just like, wow. Here I thought I was prioritizing you. Um, so different choices, you know, and just curious if you have any reflections on it. Um, well, I mean, this is something I've talked about pretty publicly now, so I, please, like, anyone, like, don't feel awkward for me. Um, but I've, I've gone through basically two years of infertility, and so I think, actually, it was funny. There, I, oh. Sorry, just keep talking. I'm to do that. Okay. Um, I think this... I had gone through like round three of IVF while like operating my business and it was like a super trying time. And uh, I don't know how much of you like know about IVF, but it's incredibly time consuming. You're basically like going to the doctor's office every single morning and, um, and you're giving yourself shots like morning, night, morning, night, and you have headaches and you feel mm. terrible for, for a good portion of it. I remember we were, I was speaking on another panel and someone asked me like, what do you think is the main difference between being a male entrepreneur versus a female entrepreneur? And I was like, well, that, this actually feels like a pretty like concrete example. Relevant. Yeah. And, um, I think it's, uh, oh, I mean the, the long story short, I ended up giving up on it because it was too much to do both. Um, and so like now my husband and I are just thinking like, okay, what do we want to do next? I don't know what's um, really next on the horizon for us, but it, there was this moment, I think it was last fall where I just felt like it was, it was all coming to be too much. And I was talking to my mom who is, who was a working mom and, uh, she, she's Japanese and we were living in Japan. So it was really rare, I think for a woman back then to also be working, but she took so much pride in her work. And she said to me, she was like, you know, Sarah, you have you have two babies, you have the baby you want to have, and you have the baby, which is your business. And like right now you just have to pick. Um, so I was like, okay, that's that actually, you know, that was the most clarifying answer for me. I think there's this, um, you know, Oprah's famous line, or I don't know if it's Madeline Albright, Albright or, uh, uh, Oprah, but it's like someone said it, you know, wise women, of them, either yeah, way. they talk about like, you wise women who are all. not in the Trump administration. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's the whole, like you could have it all, but it's just not at the same time. And I really felt one of those moments. And so, I, I think all the trade-offs that you're talking about are very real. And when, um, I, you know, I had a girlfriend who was trying to start a business, but she also got pregnant at the same time, and she was just like, you know, I just can't do both things right yeah. now. Um, that doesn't get talked about as much. I think it's all very glossy, like, oh, like, I have my briefcase and my baby, you know? Yeah. It's just, like, so not actually what it is. And obviously different for women and men, and I feel like, you know, the reason I raised this here, we're obviously talking about tech, but entrepreneurship as a vocation is a different vocation in the sense that it blends the personal and professional in ways that are not unique to it, but really rare. So then just to kind of transition to the, the part of the trade that is how you do your work, if you went back in time to yourself at the beginning or back in time to yourself at the moment of graduating from college, what do you think is the most useful advice you could give to yourself? The thing you wish you knew as things unfolded? I've got one. Hmm? I've got one. Can I go first? Go, go. Um, this is the same advice I give. Every, every, people ask me this, and I always give the same answer, and I think it's, which means I think it's the right answer because I haven't changed my mind on it in a while, that um, there is a playbook for your first pitch. There is a playbook for what defines, I think, a, hey ben, uh, a good a really good startup idea or a really good startup pitch. And there's so many things that... Really? I'm an investor. I would love if you could tell me that, but keep going. <laughs> I, I th and, and the format is that... And, 
as an example, that the, the information asymmetry that I have coming to pitch you for the first time is you know nothing about anything, and I know everything about my business that, at that stage. Roughly true, <laughs> approximately true. And, and so putting things... Certainly true for the average VC. But, but, but putting things in a format that you actually understand in terms of even slide numbers and saying this is the problem, this is the solution, things that seem really cliched as a founder when you've looked at 100 pitches aren't necessarily cliched. It's actually a great way to communicate with early investors. So the best advice I would have given myself is actually play by the rules when it comes to explaining my business externally, because there's so many things that I'm doing that are brand new and different. I don't need to reinvent the wheel everything. With, with, with everything. Yeah, there's a guy, he's actually Harvard 97 social studies, Peter Rojas, who's an investor at Betaworks, and he describes it as fluency. He just says there's a language to it, and you have to know what the words are to use, and that's just a matter of being understood like any language. Other advice you would give yourselves? Um, I would just say generally, I, I wish I wasn't so hard on myself. Uh, I, I felt like there was like this constant masochistic behavior. I would, I would hate myself if I didn't like get an email out or like if, if I wasn't maximizing all the hours in the day. I think this is no, true. No, you, no, you, you, know, you, you got to do that. That's, no, no, no. That's <laughs> terrible advice. No, do that. You, what? You, you, have, you have to hate yourself. I you think have to what yourself? You really have to hate yourself to really get oh, it done, I think. I love, I love the I'm not sure if you're being ironic aspect. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a painful thing yeah. to be so hard on yourself. And I think if any of you are in the early stages of starting a company. It's all like, broken. It'll be okay. Right, yeah. It's all broken. And, and you probably feel like there's a lot of downtime because you're waiting for a lot of people to get back yeah, to you. Yeah, well I have well that put. constant feeling of like, like, why isn't so and so responding to me? So I just have to like sit and wait. And like, God, I wish with that time I'd gone to the museum or I had like read a book. Um, but instead I had just like, you know, I, I procrastinated, yeah. well, it wasn't procrastinating, I was like hating myself for that, that downtime, um, and I, I wish I hadn't done that. I have to say, I'm so grateful that you share this kind of stuff because it's so valuable to hear. I met a founder yesterday who was doing a second time company. The company seems to be doing really well. He's like, I'm working five hours a day, tops. And I think it's a great thought, well, he's running it not as a thought experiment, but experiment, like, can you do that and still succeed? I kind of, I, I believe you can, but yeah. you know, I'm happy that he's trying. Um. I guess I would say that uh, it's a, that there are good businesses and there are good VC businesses and they're not necessarily the same. Um, and there are good lifestyle businesses and just understanding. There are also good businesses that are not merely lifestyle businesses that are not good VC businesses. Sure, I, there's many yeah. different buckets of good businesses. Yeah, totally. And, um, yep. I think just understanding what your what your impetus is for starting a business and um, just day to day, how you want to live your life and how you want to spend your time. And then just making sure that how you capitalize your business and your idea really align Related with that. To each other. Um, I think that there's a lot of, um, I guess I experience it now a little bit more on the flip side when I, when sort of decks come my way, but there's a lot of great ideas and great businesses out of, out there that are maybe not great VC businesses. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I want to ask, uh, a Harvard question, maybe the last one, because I feel like you're alluding to how, you know, this kind of feeling of I should be doing something else. Somebody once said to me that being good in school is like the hundred questions on a test and you got to get them all right. And a startup is a thousand questions and you have to pick the one to answer with the best answer that's ever been given and you ignore the other 999 while they're screaming at you. And I just kind of like thought that image of choosing was really powerful in a way that school and startups are different. But were there things that you think back on on your school experiences and especially college experiences that were um, essential and formative for you in how you do what you do now? I was going to say, because you, you gave us a, a little bit of a hint that you were going to ask us that question. Um, for me, it's so, it's so cliche, I know, but my, like the network and the friendships that I built at Harvard, I mean, a lot of those people were my initial customers. Which cliche because it's true. Yeah, I mean, it sounds probably so obvious because I, I have a clothing company and I cater towards a lot of women who, you know, also have gone to Harvard, but um, so much of the word of mouth initially happened through my, my group of friends and then they would host trunk shows for me. This is even before I had an e-commerce site. Um, so many of the employees that I met actually came through that network too. So I am forever grateful for that. Um, yeah, obvious answer, but that's really the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I think to me, it's Harvard taught me the value of, a, of the best brand, the value of brand in general. So, I mean, I think just understanding that if when it comes to raising money or building a business that 
brand is really essential. Can I ask you, like, so like an indelicate question about that, about how you manage questions around brand. So you have this product. Do you want to describe the product for a second for people? I don't even know if you had a chance to do that. Sure. It's um, a regular full-length mirror when it's off, and then when it turns on, we stream live and on-demand workouts um, of any type to you in your house. Um, so it's basically interactive home gym. Yeah. So I remember seeing the product in the beginning thinking, holy shit, this is one of these like looks like it's from the future products. Of, like That's what you imagine when you watch a science fiction movie. And then I remember there being some press in the beginning about sort of like, I didn't even remember what the word was, but like over the top narcissist, some, some negative words about that. And so you chose to have this defined brand, but then you're getting punched between the eyes by the public. How do you deal with that as a founder? Um. I mean, honestly, that was the headline for the Times article, and we sold 200 mirrors that day. So You were good. <laughs> I was good. Awesome. <laughs> um, awesome. So maybe that's it. No, no. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, to some degree, if you're building something that is working and is getting attention, you're going to get negative attention. So that doesn't really phase me or bother me. Um, yeah. But I, I, I do think that that's part of building a business that scales is that with attention comes both good and bad. I think that's a real, I mean, I think that's a mature view on the trade um, because I, you know, I've just seen so many founders for whom the personal reaction to that is so difficult. It's their baby, you know, which even just that language while true in a sense is also scary because like, it's really not a baby. It's a business. Like it's a, you know, but then it kind of, I don't know. It's very confusing. Um, other things from Harvard experience. Um, I guess I'd say read fiction. I, I was American literature is where I spent most of my time undergrad, and I still don't read much nonfiction. I read really exclusively fiction today, and I'm amazed how few like powerpoints for your VC pitch presentations and. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, um, so I know how to write. I know how to write fiction, so I can give you a model. <laughs> but I, I, I think that that it's an amazingly rare skill. People who can read a novel from beginning to end and have explored the way other people describe the world around them, um, and the ability to articulate yourself verbally or um, in, in writing, even though it usually gets dumbed down or bastardized in a, in a pitch format, that, that sort of fluency in a lot of different contexts is, is rare out there. I'd say those soft skills are missing from a lot of people in the tech space. So I'm so happy to hear you raise that, because that soft skill, that imaginative power is important. One area that I noticed that none of you have talked about is so many people in the startup journey, it's about the people who they work with, either a co-founder thing that maybe doesn't work out, or a hire, or something like that. Any reflections on the people side of building a company? I would say that's my favorite side. I, uh, Lucky you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I really love my team, and I think having worked in a company, I worked at Bain, which really actually taught me a lot. Sorry, I know that's not about Harvard, but it, it, was, it had such a good... Um, management culture, and then I worked at a private equity firm that had the worst management culture, um, and so I thought when I, when I was starting my own company, I was like, I, I really want this to be a company where uh, people are not snide to each other and, and are collaborative with each other, and, um, and that's actually been probably one of the best aspects is like I genuinely really enjoy talking to everyone I get to work with, um, which is something you get to control as a founder, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I love that aspect of it, which isn't to say it's not hard. I mean, I've had to fire plenty of people. I mean, so so many people. But um, I think there, I've learned that there's also a, a really delicate and, and good way to have that conversation. And I continue to be really good friends with a lot of the people that I've had to let go. So. Are you a sole founder? Or do you have co-founders? Um, no, I have two co-founders. One is uh, my creative director, Miyako Nakamura. She is still with me seven years out. Um, Nuri, who's my other co-founder, she left about two years ago, but she was with me for the first five years. And she was actually someone who I met at Bain. Um, and Nuri transitioning out was also, uh, you know, it was a very... It, there was like a whole discussion around it and something we, we treated really carefully. So thankfully, you know, knock on wood, I've been able to avoid the, the, the crisis founder situations. But I, I, maybe just like one tip I can share around that. My, my mom, uh, she's also a founder, and she, she used to say, you want to you wanna team up with somebody who, uh, who share the same values and who you take cabs at the same rate. Um, as. Take what at the it, same? Take cabs at the same rate as. And so she was like, you don't want to be someone, you, wanna, you don't want to, you know, be married to somebody. This was her example for marriage, but I think it applies to co-founders. Um, you don't want to, you know, be with somebody who's too thrifty, who never takes a cab. And then you don't want to be someone with, who's too spendy, who always takes a cab. You want to have the, like, the same, uh, 
the same nuanced uh, balance. I love I that, that example. That was so, so what kind true. of company did she start? She started a jewelry business, um, and so she, she, you know, she still runs it. She's 72, and, and she's been a real awesome. inspiration. That's such me. a great detail of it. Yeah. Other people, things? Um, I think actually coming from Harvard has been challenging for scaling a company, sort of at our current inflection point. You know, we're going from 50, 60 people to 100. Um, because I think uh, a lot of the people that I was surrounded with for my early life are just really exceptional, kind of excellence-oriented people. And so in the early days of hiring, you know, you tend to gravitate towards people who are similar to you. And uh, there's this sort of this rock star culture that develops. But then when you need to go from 50 to 100 and some of the roles become less glamorous, for example, you sort of need to branch out the profile. And yeah, and you don't have a co-founder. Here. And what you don't? She doesn't have a co-founder, so right. I mean, um, finding people to share those decisions with her. Is yeah, and, and just being able to um, sort of broaden the profile of people that you surround yourselves with. Yeah, I, th I remember when I was I was the CEO of a division of News Corp, and people would say things to me like, "Well, you know, that person doesn't want to advance in their career; they just want to keep doing the same thing for a decade." And I, and on the one hand, I was like, "Does not compute." On the other hand, I was like, well, maybe that's just snobbery on my part, and I should, it was the philosophical question of should you design an organization that enables that? And I still, you know, to be honest, one of the reasons I now, after a couple of years of misgivings of being, you know, an investor, any investors here, by the way? Any, okay, cool, sorry. Um, uh, the, of a couple of years of misgivings, I realized one of the things I love is my customers are founders, and I really adore founders and working with them, and I have a very small team otherwise, so that's like a problem that I get to sidestep in my current role, yep. but it's a, it's a real pressing one. Let me I ask love about, that you call your founders customers. I don't think I've ever heard any investors. Well, others have that. said it. We have it as religion. I mean, if I could just PSA for us for a second, which is founder net promoter score of us is the metric that we use to run our firm, um, and our basic belief is the very best founders pick they're VCs, so lots of people say that, but the step that they miss is that therefore you should assume everybody you're working with is going to pick you because why would you want to work with somebody who isn't going to be, mm -hmm. have a chance of being one of the very best founders? So it has been surprising for us how that, we really, it's like, to the extent we have religion, that is our religion, and, um, and it's driven a lot of the choices that we make. Uh, the ultimate co-founder relationship is two founders who are married to one another. Um, any thoughts on how you have made that work just life and work-wise? You go first. Come on. I love that this is your first panel together. I want to do a whole event series, which is like <laughs> married people who are active in whatever way professionally. You know, my wife teaches. She has more of like a portfolio of activities, but them talking to each other about how they make it work. Because this is a big part of it, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly helpful when you have the same priorities. This is, this is like the cab thing. And so both right. the example for this I is, love that example. Is, is it okay or, you know, to write an email at midnight. Basically, how many, how many nights a week is it acceptable to write a midnight email? And I guess it's the cab version of right. being married to another family. What is the answer to that question? I mean, seven days a week. Oh, I thought it was zero. <laughs> <laughs> I regard every, every late night email as a policy failure, but anyway. So, and, and I think that the, at least that that's what's worked for us is that if, if one of us has said, I need to do X for work, I mean, with, I think, 99 times out of 100, the other one has been okay with that. And if that means picking up the slack with something else at, at home, we've backed each other up. That said, it's a little bit of a unique situation, which is that I was selling my company right when Mira was launching. And so we, we've done a little bit of a handoff stress-wise, mm. which, you know, I say that like it worked out perfectly. But, I mean, the years and years beforehand of certainly me neglecting all my duties, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't necessarily solve all of that, but there is something to be said about balancing that or handing the baton off at some point. I think that, like right now at home, the the Putnam project is mirror, and that is the top priority for our apartment right now. By the um, way, I so wish that I'd asked this question like new newlywed style with like one of you closing yeah. your ears. <laughs> but Fran, I would love to hear your perspective on this. Um, I think it's both been both amazing and challenging for me. I think amazing in so far as my, my co-founder has always been my husband. So I always have the best, I've had the best partner on both my businesses anyone could ever have. And I have him 24 hours a day, seven days a week <laughs> for a very, a very good rate. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and I think that- I was just about to make an awful joke about it could cost you half. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's true. true. Um, 
but I think the, the challenge is always, uh, you know, that everyone who I hire has to pass the Lowell test, which makes has made it challenging, I think, sometimes to hire senior executives. And uh, you know, just this weekend, we were building an investor deck, and like the little Lowell icon pops up because I was like, we built this thing. I don't really love what they're doing. Do you want to go in and just add some notes? Awesome. Um, so, That's awesome. You know, it's what a superpower. Good and, it's good and bad. That's great. Well, I appreciate it. Let me ask one more question, then we'll open it up, which is this does get to the things that you studied. Um, in a general sense, which is we're now in this place in, this, in the world and in the United States in particular, where it isn't like, and I say this coming from San Francisco, where it isn't like being a tech founder is exactly like being a savior of anything. There's real concerns about the unintended consequences of success of the very kinds of companies that we and our peers build. And in terms of just general perspective on the world and how you think about that, I do have the sense that in New York, there's more consciousness and awareness of those, um, call it the, the societal consequences of what you do. How do you guys think about that? Is it relevant yet in the life of the company? Is it something, how do you think about it? I mean, for us as a retail business, re you know, apparel is the second most polluting industry in the world. Is that right? After oil and gas, yeah. Wow. So that's, that's something to really think about. And at the same time, you realize actually how much power you have uh, to change that. So, I mean, awesome. you know, just in terms of the sheer money we spend on buying inventory every year, whether it's the raw materials that we buy or the factories that we work with, we suddenly are in a position of saying, well, we will only buy this kind of raw material or awesome. we will only work with this factory that meets these kinds of standards. Um, in the logistics center, we operate, um, I'm very involved with the International Rescue Committee because I ultimately couldn't pursue my dream of working in a refugee camp. So we've got to hire a lot of recently uh, resettled refugees to work at our logistics center. So is your logistics center the one that's in Houston? Uh, no, it's in uh, it's in New Jersey. And do you also have an office in Houston? Did I read uh, that? Yeah, we've got a store in Houston. Yeah. And so, okay, got it. Because yeah. so, one of the things I was curious about is, you know, we're sitting here, coastal elites talking to each other about coastal elite things. But around the country, there's so much demand for the kind of work that your companies create. I'm just curious how you think about engaging with other places. And it sounds like you have a fulfillment center and a store. Anyway, just curious about that, but also broader social questions around your work. Yeah, and I mean, I, it really opens your eyes up to that. Um, you know, for our warehouse workers, um, we moved to $15 an hour way before uh, other companies did. Um, and then we also offer 12-week maternity and paternity leave. Oh, you. But, you know, the reason we ended up offering it is because I think a lot of the times founders are just blind to this. I, I heard that one of our um, warehouse packers he had a son, and then I went to the warehouse maybe two days later, and he was there packing. And so I was like, what are you doing here? Like, why aren't you on paternity leave? And he was like, well, there is no paternity leave. And that was kind of my wake-up moment to say, like, oh, this is not good. Like, yeah. we've got one policy for headquarters, and we've got different policies and outside, um, outside HQ. So, um, you know, I, I had to amend that. But I think a lot of the, the kind of problems that we talk about, um, that the New York Times talks about, like, you know, I, I, that was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm part of the problem. And it wasn't because I, I was trying to, you know, make more profit. It was just that I was just negligent. And so a lot of it is like, you really have to open up your eyes to the way that your policies are, are affecting other yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd use a more forgiving word than negligent, which is I think a lot of the defaults of how things are done yeah. have these kind of system choices in them. And so it's actually real, it's not just opening up your eyes, it's doing work. Cause like you could have chosen to go back to the office and not handle that issue. <laughs> you, you yes, know. yes. Other thoughts around the broader consequences of? Um, I guess timely. Like is mirror distorted so I can look thinner or no? <laughs> it's the real market opportunity. Um, I pay double. <laughs> Uh, I mean, just today, actually, uh, I got a piece of mail delivered to my office um, from an adv advocacy group uh, sort of alerting me to the fact that um, uh, that one of our VCs had uh, was, uh, or I guess that uh, the SoftBank, half of SoftBank's money comes from the Saudi family, and one of our VCs is very highly involved with SoftBank and um, sort of making a, a call that we should sort of uh, reach out to our VC and say that it made us uncomfortable, his involvement with, with SoftBank and with this money. Um, so I think these are, you know, things that are our obligation to have an opinion on and, and um, have a voice about, and certainly where we take our capital from is, is a big one. Did you, are you going to call your VC? 
I wrote an email, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think that there, unfortunately, a startup reaches a stage where it can afford to have a conscience, and I think it's very hard to have one early on, that you got to a point where you actually had fulfillment centers and logistics centers, and you reached, you know, you didn't have six employees before you became aware of these issues, and you're almost at 100 employees, and Plaid now is almost 500 employees and takes a lot of really, really great stands on things in the Bay Area and, and here, um, but also has hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. When there are six of you in a room in a WeWork yeah. um, and you're choosing the one of a thousand questions, what's the right thing to do for the environment? It's probably not that one question. I think, unfortunately, the first 10 questions, the first 100 questions, the first 500 questions probably aren't altruistic at all. I think hopefully though you reach a point where you hit question 501 and you can take the time to make that one. And knowing when that point is, is probably, it's probably earlier than most people decide to take that decision or at least it's certainly. Yeah, I don't know. I think I that's, think that's a also a function though of what questions you choose to take on. I think that being aware of where where it's important for you to have a voice and where, it, where it's maybe outside of your scope, and then making sure you weave that perspective and philosophy into every element of what you do. And that may mean that you only have a perspective on a narrow scope of issues, right. potentially. I think the challenge is feeling like you're responsible for having a perspective and taking action on all of the range of sure. things that you, that could, you possibly could possibly do. do. But being narrow about, you know, we're a health and wellness company and this is our area of focus. Yeah, in a way, like that sounds like a CEO founder skill of choosing which ones you want to focus on. Yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting question about what to, whether, I think you, I don't know. It's an interesting question about when can you afford to have a conscience because as a very tiny company, there's certain kind of issues where you have no impact on them because you just don't have a thing yet, right? You've, but then other ones like who you choose to hire and how honest you choose to be with your business partners, my guess is those are the kinds of things that you would say, oh, yeah, of course, those are early questions. You know, it's th that's a really interesting point is that morality, which is different than the environment, but just doing the right thing by people every day or not lying to a customer in a B2B context to get a sales done yeah. doesn't get a whole lot of attention in this space because the actual the actual fallout of being on the wrong side or being immoral is basically zero. The, yeah. the, the, the risk is pretty light. And so I think it is interesting that there's not more pressure put on business ethics in the startup space. Yeah, especially, by the way, I'll just say New York having a more, I don't know what to attribute it to, so I'm not going to try to oversimplify, but a more old-fashioned, long-lasting business culture of like loyalty. And it has negatives because you can have layers of cruft around getting to somebody that you don't have in the Bay Area, but it has huge positives like actually maybe that kind of morality and being thinking about the environment in a certain way are the same thing. I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, these are the tough questions. All right, speaking of tough questions, we are ready for yours. And my only request, yes, you with your hand up, my only request is to please introduce yourself. Yes, and we also wait. And there's a microphone mic coming over there, to you. and we'll be running mics around. So want to make yeah. sure we get everyone's questions. Um, so I would love to hear what, every one of your stories in terms of how would you build out the tech team, um, whether it's a tech co-founder or how did you go about it, and right. any tips, any success uh, stories. Great there. question. We are Thank an you. unusually non-technical group of, I mean, now a VC but founders. <laughs> I'm, I'm not answering that. You took my spot. What? At HPS in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you're on your own on this one. There you go. All right, other answers. Um, yeah, we, I, I will say, like, I was not a technical person. I still, like, know relatively little uh, than a technologist would, but we were late to hire. As a result, we were late to hire a CTO. Um, and when we did, it really didn't work out. And um, my, gosh, we, hired two more, uh, two different leaders, and finally now we have an amazing chief product officer. And that actually was an aha moment for me, um, having a chief product officer lead our engineering and uh, engineering product and analytics team rather than a chief technical uh, technology officer. Um, because so much of what I am trying to do is uh, show our customers what our products look like and, and sell that product well. And um, I just constantly, it, when I was talking to um, CTOs, there was, there was a constant uh, 
miscommunication, an interpretation failure. Uh, and when I, I finally, um, when I started going through my product person, it was suddenly like everything clicked, um, which is so much of the role that the product person plays. But I think there's such um, an emphasis on finding a CTO, finding a, a, an engineer that you think that's what you're supposed to have in your company. But especially if, you're, if your business is, I think, uh, a B2C business or something where uh, there, there's a, a, a selling aspect to it, it, I would strongly recommend considering um, making your, your lead uh, technology person a, C, C, a chief product officer rather than a CTO. Good tip. Yeah, I mean, I think we had, um, or actually, I had a lot of pressure in the early days to find a technical co-founder because we were building a technical. When you say you had a lot of pressure, I don't do passive voice. Does that mean that like bad VCs said, please hire somebody so we'll fund you? Um, no, I think uh, other people, when I would sort of give my draft deck to them, would say, well, on your team slide, who's going to run the technology? Who will that be? And those founders, VCs, lots of, lots of folks. Um, but to me, on the one hand, it was just trying to understand the company that I was building, which is a media company delivered through technology. It's about mm. content, brand, uh, you know, experience. We're not a heavy tech company. And I think the other is just understanding that when you're bringing on a senior leader or a co-founder, you're really getting married to that person. And I think to some degree, people bring on technical co-founders to solve a very short-term cash problem um, that, and, and then you have difficulty later on when they don't scale with the business. Um, so I was fortunate that you know, I had capital for my first business where we could actually hire engineers to, to develop and, and haven't brought on a CTO uh, as of yet. Um, but I would say that it's important to just understand what you actually need from this person, and I wouldn't like default to sort of the technical co-founder yeah. um, as, as like the default. Super different in different businesses. I mean, I'll just say my first hire when I moved to the Bay Area was a head of engineering for the company that I was running, and I felt like I was going to the doctor, like a cardiologist, like people tell me I need triple bypass surgery, I guess I should get a second opinion. Wow, two people told me I need triple bypass surgery, cut me open, doc. And, um, and the thing that I've learned over time is how the very best technologists, if you have a plain English conversation with them about what it is that they're building and why, you'll understand it. And you can get technical curious enough by learning to be able to make nuanced, important judgments. And depending on the business you're in, those judgments might be a secondary priority. But very often, in companies intended to grow quickly, those judgments are essential for the success of the business. And so you can't defer that to the cardiologist. Like, you have to learn how to do that. And that is a learning curve, but can be gone up. It's not, it's not uh, whether or not it is rocket science, rocket science is also learnable. And you can learn it, you know, even if you're a humanities major. It's also uh, like a positive guardrail, though, I think. Not, positive. I think it's a positive guardrail on what you build. Because I think sometimes Great when you point. have, like, an engineering-heavy Totally. Team, it's very tempting to fall in love with what you can build versus when, what the customer needs. Well, I'll it's generalize that a bit. You know, one of, we made a mistake passing on a company. They came back four months later. They'd built a ton of stuff. And I was like, how did you guys build so much so fast? They said, oh, easy. We just started with all the stuff we didn't know how to do. And I think a general pattern is whatever the perceived strength is of the founding team, they tend to overdo that thing because that's not usually the risk. Like if I see a team of extraordinary designers, it might be beautiful, but I know they can make it beautiful at some point or well-designed if beauty is not how it needs to be well-designed. So I think, yes, that is true of technologists. I'll just add, I think it's true of anybody with a spike in a certain, in a certain discipline. Other, yes? We have one right here. Oh, over in the back. Hey, okay, someone good. handed me a microphone, so here we go. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, I'm Austin, I'm with an early stage company called Farm Together, which is a farmland investment platform. But I've worked for a number of early companies as a first, second, third, fifth employee. Um, and I really, talking about some of the challenges between building sort of a moral company or a company that has the values you have, and then uh, the realities of starting an early company, um, one of the things I have repeatedly seen is that that pushback actually comes often from VCs. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the boardroom, why are you spending so much money on employee benefits? Why are you paying interns? Why are you not hiring everyone as a contractor? Uh, and it's really hard for, I mean, for the best founders, yes, you can push back and you can say, we need this for X and Y. And uh, how do you navigate that process? And is it even the responsibility of founders to navigate that process? Or is that something, honestly, that VCs should be you know, we, we have a minimum wage because companies can't be trusted to respect that. Should term sheets include things like uh, basic standards for employees? Yeah, I, I mean, as a 
person with an economics background, I think we have a minimum wage for a different reason than lack of trust. But um, so let me just answer as a VC and say, I see tons more bad behavior from VCs in terms of encouraging cutting corners than I do from founders. At the same time, when you say founders can push back, I mean, it starts with things like at the earliest stages, like why do you even have a board when there's five people? If you go on my blog, I have a piece, B-O-R-E-D-S. I think there's really no reason to take this literally 17th century legal institution and apply it to a modern startup. But um, I once had a founder come in in our portfolio and he said, I got fired. And we're talking about it, I was like, wait, wait, hold on, who's on the board? And he's like, well, me, my co-founder, and this VC. And I was like, how'd you get fired? He's like, the VC told me I'm fired. I was like, okay, but you have two out of three seats on the board, so I don't think you're fired. And the point was that the perception of power had so invaded that person's mind that they actually forgot. Like, the day after we write you a check, I mean, like, what power do we have? Like, we could... DDoS, I don't know, we could like send you emails until you'd want to email no more, but you'd just set a filter. I mean, so really, the founder, if, I believe, if properly construed, once the money goes in, the VC who has invested basically has no power over you. Um, and in the best world, as long as you're treating them honorably and making your choices, they backed your judgment. Now, in reality, I think a lot of times that investor-founder dynamic does not feel that way, and I think changing it is something that has to be a two-way street. Um, but I, you know, to me, that's the essential dilemma: is too much perceived power. And we just we just went through this this song and dance. That it took me a long time to stop pitching my board. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that hopefully, if if I do this again, hopefully I'll start much earlier in the process, not pitching not pitching board, your board, not pitching the board. It's it's so hard. You walk in the room of people who are generally older than you are, and they just gave you money. They gave you the thing you don't have, and it's money. And they ask you a question, you want to do that. Also, all of us in this room are, the, are, are hardwired from Harvard. Pleasers, we're pleasers. pleasers. The, the second someone says, jump, you don't ask how high, you just jump as high as you possibly can. And so when, when, when someone comes down from Olympus and gives you money and then says, you know, what's your monthly reporting package look like? You just ha hand them this phone book of amazing charts and graphs because you want the, the gold star. Yeah, it's the, interesting. I had the opposite experience, which is the first board meeting. We failed to raise a seed round then ended up raising eight and a half million dollars on Kickstarter, and then had our first, so our first board meeting was very late in the company's capital development, let's just say it that way. I was like, we're just gonna have an honest conversation. And I remember our VC saying, you know, there's more negative surprises than positive surprises today. I'm really disappointed in you guys. And I was like, oh, end of honesty, you get pitched every meeting from now on. And I'm not sure if that, I mean, I think that's a function of also picking the right partner to have, where you can have that kind of honest relationship. Uh, thank you guys for a very exciting panel. Uh, my name is Rami These Noman. These guys are pretty great, right? They're awesome, yeah. yeah. Um, my name is Rami Noman, and I'm the founder of the AI Sustainable Development Group. My question to you guys, also having a non-technical background before I entered data and uh, the technical world, is how have your experiences in these humanities subjects influenced the way that you see corporate culture, and how has it given you perhaps a contrastive lens into seeing the world compared to people who have very technical backgrounds, especially the very humanities culture that Harvard is often known for. Thank you. Um, I guess I can answer that one. I think for me, when uh, like our data team or our engineers present me information that doesn't align with my gut, my first response is to say, I don't think we asked the question right, mm. <laughs> uh, versus well perhaps like a more data or engineering oriented person who I assume would sort of trust the numbers and then act accordingly. Um, and I think sometimes the numbers are right and sometimes the question's been asked wrong. So I do spend a lot of time worrying about how we're gathering data and how we're getting information and just making sure that we're asking the right questions so that we can trust the numbers. You know, um, the company that I work for and the company I started is, is, is pretty tech heavy. I mean, now it's, we probably have 150 engineers out of a 400 person company, which is a lot. And um, I've seen, I think more engineers, the better an engineer is, the more likely they are to actually think like a humanities person in, in my well experience. Um, that a great engineer doesn't believe in, in dogmatic 
you know, binary truths because they realize there are 10 ways to architect a great system. There are, you know, something will break no matter what. They're, they live in a lot of gray area. A great engineer tackles problems from 10 different angles and is excited to see the problem solved differently by the person next to them. And then a less sophisticated engineer is the person who thinks about dogmatic approaches mm -hmm. to things. I think, I mean, one of our, our head of engineering said, about a year ago, he said that that the biggest problems in or the biggest bugs are always written by the best engineers because the worst engineers are copying code that works, and so their code also works. And so I think the better an engineer is, and whereas great engineers are building something brand new, and so of course they they mess it up. And so um, I've actually found a great alignment with with a humanities background and a truly truly great technologist. Yeah, I wonder if the best. Thinkers on the humanities also think more like great engineers in a lot of ways. I don't know, that's fascinating. I would like to see that tone that you just expressed more often in the comments on Hacker News. I feel like you could you could do very well in the comments on Hacker News. <laughs> I, I have no interest in reading yeah, or participating enough. in the comments on Hacker News. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> All right, I think I saw another question over here, and I think this might be our last one, so let's make it count. Interest in reading yeah, or participating enough. in the comments on Hacker News. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> All right, I think I saw another question over here, and I think this might be our last one, so let's make it count. Now nah, you'll be fine. Um, so I'm curious, um, Who are you? Please talk to our parents. Um, lifespan of, of the, the product. hardware product. Um, you know, really the, the intelligence of our product lies in, um, in the content and in the software. The hardware is really the conduit so that we can get into your home and, and serve you our content. Um, so most of our updates, upgrades, et cetera, are made, um, you know, via software updates and not changes to the hardware. So, um, you will likely not see a V2 of the mirror product. That's not really where our business is headed, and uh, hopefully, we'll be in your home for a long time. Um, and do I do I regret my Harvard education? Um, absolutely not. I love everything about Harvard, and would go back tomorrow. We had two founders actually who dropped out, sold their company to LinkedIn, one of our earliest investments, and then like, you know, we're talking to them about when you're going to stop your company. If we have com founders who sell to a company and are on a vesting schedule, we give them a countdown clock that counts down to when their vesting is over. Please don't tell any acquire, don't tell Amazon that. Um, but then they were like, this is crazy. We're going back to Harvard. And they went back and finished their degrees. It was nuts. Um, yeah. Any regrets? I don't have any. I mean, the university administration was like awful. Um, but other than that, you know. It's, I, it's hard. I guess, I don't know if the, like, the ends justify the means for me. Like I, I had the thing where I raised VC money, I started a company, then I, I sold it for a great outcome, and now I can go on to the next one. So the story looks like the right story, and so the beginning should be the right beginning, since the ending is the right ending. So I, I'm, not a, I'm not really an objective. Huh. I'm not sure if I'm an objective person. I do know that I still have, I don't know, how, how many of you guys have still have the nightmares for, you wake up and there's an exam for a class you didn't register? Like, I have those all the time, though. It's, all the time. It's crazy. And my, my, my dad is Harvard 73, and he says that he still has, like, wow. waking up just, like, covered in sweat that he has to be I know at Emerson. an excellent therapist. For, for, so I don't know what that means. If, if I, I regret the fact that I still wake up terrified yeah. of my, like, literature exam. Yeah. Um, I, I played a lot at Harvard. I had a, I had a lot of fun. I probably didn't study as much as I should have, and I, I had a great time. Again, I, I go back to the friendships that I made because those, I mean, they're my closest friends today, and um, when the business goes through high times, I get to share it with them, and then when the business goes through terrible times, yeah. like I get to be really candid with them in a way that that's I awesome. can't be with my team or, or my investors to that point, right? Um, so I would say that's number one, but I, I will say I think the part of the Harvard education or the part of my business education that really was missing um, coming out of college is like I just didn't know anything about business and anything I know about business really came from my time in management consulting and then in private equity. Um, and I use those tools on a, on a daily basis. And so while it was completely random that I ended up at those places, um, I, I'm grateful for them. And, uh, you know, going back, I, I if I had not had those experiences, I definitely could not be running my company today. So if you are, you know, in the humanities and you think you want to start your own business, I think just like some very basic business knowledge. What is a PL? What is a balance sheet? Like what's cash flow? Like, 
you know, just getting a little smart on those things because those are those are not hard things to learn. Um, I think it just gives you a leg up in all the all the uh, management that you will have to do as a CEO. So you don't kind of become just like the creative person. Um, you get to actually own your company and run your company. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think that's great. The um, the the reflection for me, you know, I joke about the administration because when I ran I ran PBH and we used to battle the administration all the time. But I think part of what I realized in that, and I still use lessons from courses, like I think about them, um, and they were really informative. You know, Xbox, by the way, great class. Like, everybody should learn how to write. Most of the good CEOs who I know are really great writers. Um, but, you know, it just occurred to me at some point that I wasn't doing an extracurricular, that I was actually doing like a real thing that was a nonprofit that actually did things, and then all of a sudden the line between school and reality dissolved, and it's like, okay, let's just keep doing this. And so that was a really powerful lesson, and, you know, blockmates still, you know, magnificent, you know, friends and allies along the journey. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just close by saying, you know, each of you, like, really, I mean, really appreciate the different variations in perspective and heartfelt and, and um, thoughtful insights. You know, as a VC, one of my observations is that the very best investors in companies, even better than VCs, present company excluded, are founders mm -hmm. of venture-backed companies or companies that have a similar approach because you have such empathy and that founders seeking out other founders for support, it's just been so amazing to see that community give. And so let me just ask, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what is the best way to reach out to you? I emailed me. Okay. I I'm just Sarah with an H at mmfleur.com. And I, I, usually, I usually do respond to every email. Awesome. Maybe not at midnight, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you do, use the scheduled send thing in Gmail and just have it send the next morning so that they won't, you know... I know. I have 5,000, like, 700 emails in my inbox, but I yeah. will get through that right. at some point. Send her an email. <laughs> yeah, burnettmere.co. And I think always helpful if um, you're clear what success looks like from the interaction, then I can be the most helpful. Awesome. Yeah, like, no, like, hey, I noticed you're a founder. Can we get coffee? Yeah, happy to grab coffee if I can be helpful. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can get me at lowell at plaid or lowell.putnam at gmail. And I do have a promise that I've been able to, to make good on, which is that I will review any deck anyone sends me and give you page-by-page -page comments. God bless. Can I send you things we get pitched? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Hot damn. Absolutely. Uh, we may have a job opening on our team. Uh, the, um, so and anybody on our partnership can say yes. Another way we vary from the ponderous VC, let me go talk to my partners. Um, and I'll say for me, if you guess at any, I, I, I wish I could stay for the event later. Unfortunately, I can't. But if you guess at any way to reach me digitally and I'm not on the other end of that as a person who like markets money to founders, that's my fault. So please tell me. But like DMs are open, Roy at Bloomberg Beta, whatever. I mean, I unfortunately have to manage all the inboxes, but I kind of enjoy it. So thank you guys very much. Thank and thank you. you all of you for being a great thank group. You.